Senator the Honorable Franklin Khan, Minister of Rural Development and Local Government. And we are, of course, um, the Member of Parliament for the constituency of Labre. We are, of course, expecting other members of Parliament to be present here this evening. The Permanent Secretary and other officials from the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government. My own colleagues and council here at the Sipa Regional Corporation. Our dear CEO and other administ administrative staff of the Sipa Regional Corporation. And I'm recognizing other chairmen as well of various regional corporations present amongst us. I recognize the Mayor of San Fernando, the chairman of the Pinal Labor Regional Corporation, the chairman of the Sandy Grande Regional Corporation, the chairman of the Samal Avanti Regional Corporation, is of course the chairman of Targa as well. And I was mentioning members of parliament will be present, Mem of members of parliament will be present here, let me recognize as well, representing the opposition leader, Dr. Suraj Rambachan, the member of parliament for the constituency of Tabakit. Members of the Sipara Chamber of Commerce, the president is here himself, and other members, members of the Separia Interreligious Group. We heard from Father Martin Leon. He's a member of the Separia Interreligious Group. Burgesses of the region of Separia. Other members of the public. I'm recognizing as well some members of the local government reform committee. Members of the media. All of the distinguished Ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant good evening to all of you, and it is indeed a pleasure for me, on behalf of the Council of the Separate Regional Corporation, to welcome all of you to this public consultation on local government reform, hosted, of course, by the Minister and the Ministry of rural development and local government. And when I say I welcome all of you on behalf of the Council of the Corporation, ladies and gentlemen, for information, to whom do I refer? It has to do with local government, of course. To whom do I refer when I make mention of the Council of any municipal corporation? For local government purposes, Trinidad, and I'm talking about Trinidad alone, Trinidad is divided into municipal corporations. There are 14 municipal corporations in Trinidad. Tobago is governed by a totally different act altogether. A municipal corporation can either be a city corporation, of course, there are three city corporations, Port of Spain, San Fernando. Sorry, there are two city corporations, Port of Spain and San Fernando. A municipal corporation could also be a borough corporation. There are three borough corporations, Arima, Shabuana, San Point Fortin. Or a regional corporation, as we are in Superior, and there are nine regional corporations. Regional corporations have replaced what used to be referred to as county councils up to 1990. This Sipa Regional Corporation, our region, ladies and gentlemen, spans a geographical area of some 510 kilometers squared. And we serve approximately 82,000 Burgesses. A person residing in a regional corporation, in a corporation, in a municipal corporation, is referred to as a Burgess. So we are 510 kilometers squared, 82,000 residents. And yet, sir, we are not the largest regional corporation in Trinidad. There are other regional corporations larger than we are. 
Mind you, for comparison, Grenada has an area of 344 kilometers squared. Remember, we are 510 kilometers squared. St. Vincent has an area of 389 kilometers squared. Tobago. Tobago is 300 kilometers squared, and they have a population of 61,000 people. Remember, we have 510 kilometers squared, a population of 82,000 people. Tobago, 300 kilometers squared, 61,000 persons. I am giving you these figures, ladies and gentlemen, so that you can have a clearer picture as we get into local government reform as to where we are as regional corporations in terms of size and population in comparison to neighboring islands only so that you might have a better understanding as to the complexity and the enormity of our administrative responsibility. Our neighboring municipality, point 14, point 14, the borough of point 14, is 24 kilometers squared, 24 kilometers squared, 29,000 budgets. We, the Spire Regional Corporation, we are more than 20 times the size of the borough of point 14, and we have more than 50,000 Buddhists residing in our region than they have. And they, I'm saying this silently, their budgetary allocations are more or less the same as ours. All of these figures which I have mentioned, ladies and gentlemen, alone are justification for local government reform. But I was explaining what's a council. For local government election purposes, municipal corporations, and I explain what's a municipal corporation, municipal corporations are divided into electoral districts. Our Sipai Regional Corporation is divided into nine electoral districts. So that after the local government elections, we at the Sipai Regional Corporation, we will have nine elected councillors. Now, by law, thereafter, after the local government elections, four aldermen, based on proportional representation, are to be appointed to each municipal corporation. This is something relatively new. This was introduced in time for the last local government elections. And that's another question in terms of reform. Will this form of proportional representation continue? We need to know. But in terms of the composition of a council, in our case here, the nine elected councillors and the four aldermen, 13 members, comprise the council of the Sipa Regional Corporation. Of course, the council will then proceed to elect the chairman and vice chairman from among its membership. And it's on behalf of this council, ladies and gentlemen, that I welcome all of you to this reform. And you see me? I'm going to take time out now to introduce my council to all of you. Our vice chairman, councillor for the electoral district of Otahiro Tilak, Mrs. Chanari Ramadar Singh. May I report to you, as is always the case, Minister, when we have council meetings, Dr. Rambachan, we always have 30 members, all members of our council present tonight. We have all members, all 30 members of our council present here this evening. The councillor for the electoral district of Cedras, Mr. Ramesh Yulal. The councillor for the electoral district of Brighton, designated, call him Bump, councillor Gerald Davisev. The councillor for the electoral district of Irene, councillor Aline Ramdeo. For the electoral district of Palaseco, and Ms. Neptune always tell me it's Palaseco, Ms. Christine Neptune. 
the Councillor for the Electoral District of Mondesi, Councillor Derek Bowen. For the Electoral District of Avocat San Francisco North, Councillor Rajwanti Bullock. For the Electoral District of Sipaya West Faisabad, Councillor Maurice Alexander. And we're getting down to our four older men, our older men, older man Shankar Gilok Singh, older man Junior Thompson, older man Dr. Sean Ramrup, older man Patsy Ransom. And my name is Leo Dudnat, I'm the Councillor for the Electoral District for Sipari San Francisco North, and I'm the Chairman of the Sipari Job Corporation. Now, I hasten to add, ladies and gentlemen, under this present system, the council, and may I take time out to recognize the uh, presence now of the of Senator the Honorable Stuart Young, who is, of course, the Minister in the Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs. I was saying, I hasten to add that the council, under this present system, is only the policy-making arm of the corporation. Full stop. Our powers are limited only to policy-making. Implementation of policy falls strictly under the purview of the administrative arm of the corporation. Now, I am hearing with the reform, there will no longer be a Ministry of Local Government. I'm hearing that the Municipal Corporation Act would be amended to give corporations a greater level of autonomy. And councils will now have executive authority, similar to what is enjoyed by the Tobago House of Assembly. I'm hoping really today we get more details about issues like these. Under which corporation, sorry, under which governmental authority if only for accountability purposes, will corporations now fall? What would really be the composition of these executive councils? What would be the management structure of corporations? Who will be the employees accountable to? But I'm a little taken aback. Mind you that we do not have a base document, a white paper. As it, as it were, to refer to, as indeed we had when, and I recall when Mrs. Hazel Manning was Minister of Local Government and she was driving the reform process, there was a proposed document that we could have referred to, out of which we could have made comments, and that's really commendable. As was the case when Dr. Rambachan was Minister of Local Government and reform was being considered, he had produced a booklet for comment outlining precisely which section of the act, which paragraph, which line, which word had to be amended, edited, deleted, etc. And that as well is commendable. My issue right now, you see, is that we have only general ideas. What exactly will be the additional responsibility of corporations? Will the provision of social and other governmental services be added to our portfolio? What aspects of government are going to be decentralized? What about staffing? And who is going to manage the transition? And I'm hearing that the reform is scheduled to be completed before the next local government elections during the last quarter or so of this year, and that local government elections will not be postponed. But when will we arrive at the stage of having a legislative agenda? What are the timelines? Will political parties have sufficient time after the act is passed and the new format is now known to prepare for local government elections? So today, in the absence of a white paper, and I'm suggesting that a white paper can still be prepared, in the absence of such, I'm really hoping today for more details and specifics as to the reform proposals for indeed, and I'm hastening to that, all of us 
we are really committed to local government reform. Let me just quickly add, ladies and gentlemen, I mentioned earlier that the implementation of policy falls under the purview of the administrative arm of the corporation. The administration is headed by a chief executive officer. Our CEO is here, Mrs. Gauri Jean. And in each corporation, there are four other chief officers. I'm not too happy, CEO Gauri Jean, that all of our chief officers are not here. But um, I need to mention that in each corporation, apart from the CEO, there are four other chief officers, a principal medical officer of health, a corporate secretary, an engineering and surveying officer. And I'm saying our chief financial officer is here. She is here as well, Ms. Linda Wheat-Wells. And also attending this forum this evening, ladies and gentlemen, are some of our heads of the various sections of the corporation and other members of staff as well, other members of the administrative staff as well. I'm taking the liberty to welcome you on behalf of the administrative staff as well. So on behalf of all of us at the Separia Regional Corporation, I warmly welcome all of you to this, the fourth public forum of local government reform. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, Mr. Wesley Gibbings, and it's nice to be here in Siparia, the Sand City. For those of you who don't know, and I hope there's none of you, I am Franklin Khan, Minister of Rural Development and Local Government. <coughs> welcome to the consultations on local government reform in Trinidad, and welcome to Plaza Siparia. My thanks in particular to the chairman of the Siparia Regional Corporation, which you heard an extended discourse from, Councillor Leo Dudnak <coughs> for hosting these consultations here in Separia. <coughs> and thank you all for coming out this evening. I want to especially recognize the Minister of Energy and the Member of Parliament for the constituency of Library, Ms. Nicole Oliver. <coughs> I also want to recognize the Member of Parliament for Tabakit, former Minister of Local Government a former Minister of Works and Transport. I don't know if he is following in my footstep or I am following in his footstep, <coughs> but his two portfolios I, I hold also. Um, welcome to the consultation, MP Rambachan. <coughs> we'll now show a, a, a short video clip to, to put everything into context. Home sweet home. You grew up here. And with hard work, <coughs> prayers, and dreams, you made this into the place where you raise your family. But four years ago, the river changed course, right after they cleared the land for that compound on the hill. We and the neighbors reported it to our councillor. Not under local jurisdiction. Waterways were not <coughs> under the control of the corporation. Ministry of Works. No biggie. We went to the regional office. That began the trail, a trail of paper and taxi fares, door after door, letter <clears throat> after letter, a trail as long as the river itself, left wondering which was the real destructive force, this or the long and winding river of red-taped bureaucracy. <clears throat> it was now simply a question of which would get to us first, Ladies and gentlemen, the video you just saw illustrates a system that then the dynamics of which are not unfamiliar to most of us, if not all of us. Whether it is a river, a crack in a drain, an empty lot next door, delivering social services for someone in need, a blown street light, school repairs, a local heritage site, waste management, a bus shelter, what have you, the list goes on and on. <coughs> Must I dare say that under the current system, when a community needs to get something done, it has to take place in one of the many clogged and narrow arteries that run through the centralized heart of government. It is in my humble opinion that this is a fundamental government impediment to service delivery in Trinidad and Tobago. These consultations are unique in the sense that it is one of the few occasions 
that a public consultation in Trinidad and Tobago will take place only in Trinidad. The reason being, quite simply, ladies and gentlemen, is that Tobago's local government machinery and service delivery system have progressed well beyond that of Trinidad and Tobago. It is a fact. Go to Tobago, and everything seems to operate better there. The public buildings are better kept. The, the verges of the road are better kept. The whole atmosphere, the garbage disposal system is more efficient. And this is directly due to reforms in their local government status and a new social contract that now exists between the Tobago House of Assembly and the people of Tobago. Like many communities across Trinidad and Tobago, Tobago used to have to come to central government for just about everything. Today, with legislation passed in 1996, the THA was given legal and local authority and autonomy to change that. Because of the THA Act number 40 of 1996, Tobago now has the authority and autonomy to inform, manage, and dictate, and influence virtually every aspect of its own affairs and development. As a result, we see examples in Tobago. For example, TEMA, the Tobago Emergency Management Authority. There are something called medical alert devices that, devices that have been issued by the THA. Um, 530 elderly persons have a system, a chain, where if they fall or if they, they need emergency help, they just press the button. I mean, this is, is very modern. But all this social service, service delivery system operates in Tobago with very, very positive and, and immaculate results. These are some of the few examples, ladies and gentlemen, that illustrate the differences in our bureaucracy. Tobagonians have the power to treat with their own community. They have to, the power to treat with their own unique culture and their own way of life. Why shouldn't we? Is somebody in Siparia? Siparia has its own unique culture. Faisabad has its own unique culture. Labre, Vesini has its own unique culture. Point Fortin, Sidras, and Ikakas, they are, we are not the same in a general sense as the people who live on the East West Corridor. Just as the Tobagonian is distinct, we have distinct social and geographic entities in Trinidad that we need to focus on and to build communities out of those. And today, ladies and gentlemen, this is really what we are exploring here this evening in this island-wide series of consultations. But before I delve directly into the local government reform process, let me just deal with a couple issues that are fundamental to the ministry that I know head. We have formed this administration, a ministry of rural development and local government. For those of you who follow the election campaign closely, you will realize that the People's National Movement promised two transformational issues. One, local government reform, and two, the creation of a brand new ministry called the Ministry of Rural Development. So transformational is, transformational is this ministry. And by the way, I am the transformation minister. Eh? So fundamental is this ministry that this administration and the leadership of Dr. Rowley cut the size of the cabinet from 33 to 23. 10 ministries were merged into other ministries. And yet he saw it fit to have a ministry totally dedicated to rural development. And to me, that is transformational. Local government reform is also transformational. And let me just make a point here. One of the attributes of underdevelopment is that nothing transformational happens in the society for decades. An administration gets into power, and they plod along doing the same thing, probably slightly with slightly more efficiencies here and there. And every time you catch yourself, five years has passed. You may be voted in for another term of office, and then 10 years will pass. Another administration will come into power, and 15 years will pass. And then by the time you catch yourself, a quarter of a century has elapsed in a society. And when you look back and analyze in retrospect, 
nothing transformational has happened. And that is the problem with governance in Trinidad and Tobago and our concept of development versus underdevelopment. So why, why we saw these two transformational issues as fundamental to the new governance? Rural development in particular. I'm not blaming which administration or which administration didn't happen. What has happened in independence in Trinidad and Tobago is that the development process was skewed towards urban Trinidad and, well, Tobago as well in, in, in most cases, so urban Trinidad. This administration is taking a focused look at that. We have to swing the pe pendulum back towards more balanced spatial development. And the only way that could happen, because if you do projects based on economic analysis, rural development will never get anything because population centers dictate where development takes place. Because you're looking at rate of return, you're looking at investment side, you're looking at market side. So anything you have to cite. KFC wouldn't go and build a, an outlet in Cedros. The public bank would not go and open in Santa Flora. So if a rural development to take place, there must be direct government policy intervention. And ladies and gentlemen, let me just make this point. Because at the end of the day, I'm a politician also. This process of local government reform and rural development is non-political. I'll show you. Toko Matlot, Mr. London is here. Largely African, strong supporters of the PNM. Major underdevelopment in Toko Matlot. Go to my former constituency, Maruga. Largely African, strongly PNM, total underdevelopment. We go down to Sijasi Kakas, largely East Indian population, supporters of United National Congress over the decades, still largely undeveloped because the forces of economics do not discriminate politically. They discriminate under the economic parameters on which you work. And that is why, it is my opinion, it's the opinion of this government, that the whole concept of rural development is fundamental in switching the pendulum and switching the focus back to the people in rural areas and bring back more equitable spatial distribution of developmental process and amenities in all of Trinidad and Tobago. Let me get back to the core presentation of local government reform. Since 1962, Successive administration have researched, tracked, discussed, consulted, what have you, in terms of decentralization of government through the mechanism of local government reform. A lot of talk. The high point of that really was really under NAR in the 1990 implementation of the Municipal Corporation Act 21 of 1990. That was the first time something fundamental happened in local government reform. The old county council system was disbanded and the Municipal Corporation Act was implemented. From 1990, it is now 26 years, and again, we, we got stuck in a sense of inertia where nothing fundamental took place after that. What this means, ladies and gentlemen, is essentially successive administration have kicked the can down the road. So Ramachan himself is here. He says, Hazel Manning probably did the most research and consultation and documentation and reports on local government reform. It did not happen. She had white paper, she had green paper, she had all different color papers. It did not happen. So Ramachan himself had a white paper. But for some strange reason, the, we, we were not able as a country to break through the barriers of inertia. What I am saying, ladies and gentlemen, I am given the commitment of this administration that local government reform and local government transformation is going to happen this time. Out. <laughs> the pitfalls of centralized government have been uncovered, discussed, and debated. We now have a wealth of information. This, these consultations are taking place because in a modern democracy, you have to consult. I like to say, when I went to the Ministry of Local Government, there, there was a pile of reports that high on local government reform, from boundary changes, to
to what have you, to what have you, to legislative changes, um, to everything you have. But they were just reports. And I mentioned earlier, Mrs. Manning had a lot of initiative. Mr. Rambachan himself had a lot of initiative. But what we are seeing now, I am saying, is that this administration now has a political will to make this happen. So, local government reform, I want to make one further point on it. It is psychological. It is you in your community taking charge of your community. It is beyond garbage collection. It is beyond building a retaining wall or a community center or clearing an empty lot for mosquitoes. It is more than the tangible and the physical matters. Almost every decision made by central government inevitably affects our mind and our software, our hearts, our sense of well-being, our sense of autonomy, our sense of creativity, our sense of community, our sense of being able to make a difference in our basic capacity to dream and to passionately pursue this dream are taken away from us by central government. Above all, ladies and gentlemen, the centralization of decision-making affects our needs and our ability to unite and build strong communities. So in a very real sense, and in particular the pace on which this modern world is moving, centralized government, I dare say, without fear of contradiction, is more likely to be the problem than the solution. The impediments of the local government structure over the years that, are, that stopped local government from being efficient, from consistent, of relevant, cost-effective, all these, I attribute it to about five matters. First and foremost, political interference, manipulation, and expediency. For some strange reason, nobody wanted to devolve power. And ladies and gentlemen, politicians aside, the human being likes to be in charge. He likes to hold power. And nobody voluntarily gives up power. The only person in the world politics that I know did that is a guy called Mikhail Gorbachev in the Soviet Union in a system called Perestroika, and he disbanded the Soviet Union to all its respective republics. He's the only person in the world who has ever done it. Because you do not take away power from yourself. So if you are in charge, you don't want to stop being in charge. So I am the only minister who is putting myself out of a job, you know. Because I am saying, or the government is saying, that we will be disbanding the Ministry of Local Government. And we will be formulating a brand new ministry called the Ministry of Rural Development. Because, and I say this again without fear of contradiction, unless you cut the umbilical cord, the child will always remain attached to you. So therefore, what is the sense of empowering local government when you still have a ministry of local government with a big stick over their head? What is the sense of empowering local government where every single thing has to come to the minister's desk for approval? I spend half of my day approving foolishness. Sometimes I ask the PS, do I have to approve this? She said, yes, according to the regulations, this, that, and the other. Because nobody gives up authority. And this is the fundamental psychological shift that this whole process is putting forward. It, it, it is a mind game. And it is empowering communities now to act and to act on their own behalf. But I will deal with that a little later on. There has always been inadequate funding. Administration come, administration goes. Somehow the other, the budgetary system doesn't cater for the local government process. I'll give you an example. During the finance committee meeting in the parliament after this budget, Mr. Rambachan himself asked me a question. There was an allocation of $4 million for recreation grounds in Kuva Tabaki Talparo Regional Corporation. I think there are 100 and something grounds or something to that effect. How many? 186, 136. 
Four million dollars for 126 gods. This is madness. Four million dollars is obviously insufficient to maintain 136 gongs. Okay. But here how the systems get complicated. There's something called the sports company of Trinidad and Tobago. And all of a sudden, the regional corporation has no money, and the sports company appears and starts to build a pavilion and start to light up the gong. You know, you know from, not from whence they came. Who have they consulted to know which of the 35 gongs in your area to put lights on six? Obviously not the councillors. So that is where central government comes into conflict with local government. So today, by legislation, and Mr. Young will deal with that when we come on the platform, by legislation we will correct that. So that the sports company cannot go to Tobago and say they come to put lights on a gong in Tobago. Mr. London will tell them to take the next flight back home. But they can come into Siparia. They can come into Kuva Tabaki Talparo. They can go into Sandy Grandi. And Mr. and Mr. Terry London doesn't know which gong they're coming to fix. There's a system called Pure. I was a minister of works. Mr. Rambachan was a minister of works. Pure spends approximately $1 billion on wood paving every year. Half of which is to pave minor roads. Where does the cadre of minor roads come from? Not from the corporations. And if that, if that $500 million that Pure spend on minor roads is allocated to the regional corporations, they will have sufficient money and they will know what are the roads that need the priority. So it is, it is not that the country has no money, you know. It is the allocation of resources. It is so centralized in the psyche of our leaders that it is not filtering down to the various communities. We are going to put that right. Inadequacy of supporting legislation. Mr. Young will deal with that extensively during the question period. And ladies and gentlemen, a sluggish administrative structure, which I will deal with very shortly. There's also an overall lack of transparency, which again, we will deal with um, as the presentation continues. So local government has become inefficient and burdened by the bureaucracy because control, funding, and authority is centralized. And it is centralized within the cabinet and within the Ministry of Local Government Corporation. Local government. Ministry of Local Government. And corporations, and hear this point carefully, corporations as we speak are currently being treated as departments of the ministry. I want to make one point fundamentally clear here today. The Ministry of Local Government is not local government. The Ministry of Local Government is central government. Local government resides in the ambit of the regional corporation. Again, that is why we have to justify to disband the Ministry of Local Government. And now, you will be accountable from a financial point of view to the Ministry of Finance. You have your allocation each year, you have to account to the Ministry of Finance. You have to account to the Auditor General of how you spend the public's money. So you're not, we wouldn't be under scrutiny, you know. We will take all the oversight of saying, come to the Minister to say which drain to fix. You will decide at your council which drain you want to fix and how much it will cost. And you will tender it according to the procurement legislation. And then you will be now accountable to the Ministry of Finance of how you spend the money and the Auditor General in terms of transparency and accountability. Beyond that, you're on your own. And you know who is the ultimate arbiter in this thing? The Burgesses, you ladies and gentlemen, because if they don't perform, you'll vote them out in the next election. So they are accountable to you. They're not accountable to me as minister. The corporation should now be accountable to their burgesses on how they perform. We will be transparent. We will tell you how much money they get. We will publish it on the papers and say how much money Siparia get, how much they get for bridges, how much they get for roads, how much they get for cemeteries. And now you call them in their council meetings and a lot of public consultation will take place. Say how you spend the $20 million on, on, on recreation. Well, show me and show us the citizens of Siparia how that money was spent. So our vision is a fully operationalized and networked local government system, people-driven, 
and people-driven development, and we will accomplish this as, as any national vision. We envisage a quantum leap in all aspects of service delivery. Health, community development, development of public spaces, local culture, um, the economy, communications, all aspects of the activities in your community, or most aspects of it, will now reside in the level of the regional corporation and the empowerment of local government bodies. So now your ability to fix a road, to build a retaining wall, to launch a festival, to have, will have direct impact on the quality of life of your community. And local government reform, ladies and gentlemen, puts that power back in your hands now. Finally, I want to just go through specifically what we plan to do. We stated in, in the PNM manifesto that our vision for local government reform seeks to remove all the red tape and bureaucracies that prevent local government bodies from doing their work in an effective and efficient manner. This document, as you all know, has now been advanced and has been adopted by the cabinet as official government policy. To revolutionize and to bring the system in line with the recurrent recommendations of the many teams, committees, and different administrations that have engaged this process over the years. We now propose the following. Taxes. Through legislation, and Mr. Siotong will be here to take questions, we plan to change the taxation legislation and the financial legislation to allow local government bodies to be in charge of the collection and retention, not only collection, the collection and retention of local taxes, in particular, the land and building taxes. So if you, as a local body, is in charge of collecting this money and keeping it for your own community's development, you will obviously more, go more aggressive to collect the taxes because you know all the people in Separia Regional Corporation, who building you have, you will have your rules, and you will be able to monitor on a day-to-day -day basis who have paid the taxes, and you will send out your officers to sell people, hey man, tax due, you know, March interest start to accrue. And then that now will, will call for greater compliance, so that the monies will be now being retained by the regional corporation for expenditures. In all over the world, in the United States and in the UK, local taxes are paid for to the local corporations for the development of the local communities. And that is basically the model we have been going with. Secondly, Mr. Dudnat spoke a lot about executive authority. He is right that the council is just policy formulation, implementation and the execution of, 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 of policy is a function of the administration. In a large sense, that is the structure of central government also, eh? but the cabinet makes policy. The, 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 the implementation of policy comes through the public service. But a minister still has more authority than a chairman of a corporation. Um, because most of the legislation is written that you have to take direct and general control from the minister whereas the, the Municipal Corporation Act doesn't give you that at all. So, there's the THA model. I think there's a misconception in these, these um, consultations, and probably I'm guilty of it also, is to saying that we're going ahead, lock, stock, and barrel with the THA model. What we are doing, ladies and gentlemen, we are saying, as a matter of policy, this administration wants to give executive powers to the regional corporation. As to what form it will take, as to what structure it will take, that is the reason we have these consultations. And that's the reason we don't have said that we don't have a white paper. Because there is a conflict of when you, you, you engage in consultation. If you prepare a document and say, con comment on this, they say, well, you don't know what you're doing already, or you comment to consult with us for. And then if we, we leave the, the slate too blank, they will say, um, there's nothing to consult on. And what should we comment on? Because the slate is blank. So you have to have a, a judicious balance between those two. As to where, and think we think we have a judicial balance because we have general policy outlines, and we're now consulting with you to, to, to effect the, the detailed mechanics, mechanics of how this thing will work. This has been an area of keen interest 
okay? In all the consultations we have and we seek your comments. Accountability, I dealt with that a while ago. Since you will be more, both with decision makers and tax collection will be now vested in local government bodies. Accountability, ladies and gentlemen, is of paramount importance. And I want to stress this. Eh? If we are a corrupt society, and corruption is centralized, if we decentralize, all we do is we decentralize in corruption. You know? So instead of five people engaged in corruption, you know how about 100 people engaged in corruption. Because the fundamental thing is not the, the devolution of power, you know. The fundamental thing is the psyche of corruption. So you have to be accountable, okay? And you have to understand that if we give you more power and more authority, it comes greater responsibility. And for heaven's sake, Trinidad and Tobago, please try to understand that. Because if you don't understand that as a people, if you don't understand that as citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, we go in nowhere. All this consultation means absolutely nothing. Okay? That is the fundamental crux of the matter. If you are empowered, you have to be accountable. You have to be transparent. You have to be honest. And you have to understand that you are in charge of the people's money. The money is not yours. And you have to account to the people. Okay? The money is not yours to, to spend as if it is your bank account. It is the public purse, and the public purse must be, be, be spent to be discretion. We move on to areas of new responsibility. The chairman of Siparia mentioned it. I was very commendable on the Municipal Corporation Act of 1990. But let me just criticize it for a minute. All the, municip all the Municipal Corporation Act did was change the boundaries and change the name, you know. So from the County Council, so from St. Patrick County Council, it became Siparia Regional Corporation. From Narefa Nar Mayaro County Council, it became Mayaro Rio Claro Regional Corporation. For St. Pat for St. Andrew, St. David County Council, it became Sandy Grandi Regional Corporation. For most of Caroni County Council, it became Kuva Tabaki Talpao Regional Corporation. But the schedule of responsibility largely remained the same. Minor roads, minor water courses, cemeteries, public spaces, recreation gong, some aspect of public health, and garbage collection. Beyond that, so a county council fundamentally was no, is no different than a regional corporation now. So what we are seeing now, here is where we're making some fundamental shifts. And we must add new responsibilities to the schedule and new budgeting. Because the world has progressed. So you can't live in the 20th century, in the 21st century, no, ladies and gentlemen. School maintenance, for example. As we speak, there are some 800 and something primary schools and 200 and oh, 100, just under 200, a little more than 200 secondary schools. Every September, you know what is the headline when school open? 12 schools can open. 14 schools, parents protesting as to why the school can open, why the school could open. Because it is one company called the Education Facilities Company Limited that is responsible for all the maintenance and the construction work in these almost virtually a thousand schools in Trinidad and Tobago. How good it will be if the Siparia Regional Corporation, knowing it has about 12 or 15 secondary schools, and say 80 or so primary schools, have that responsibility. It will be a more laser beam focused approach. So when you award the contracts during the summer vacation, you could manage that, virtually micromanage it, and make sure that the delivery is in time for when the reopening of schools. Under the present system, the education facilities company cannot do it. And this is where the local government reform process Will be, will be filtering down to the community level because you will have responsibilities. Go to Tobago. Ever had Tobago school? They open when September reach? Very rarely. So the, the concept is that you will be empowered to 
manage your affairs in your community. Social service delivery, classic example. An old lady needs pension. She got to run up and down in social welfare office and thing. If that goes into the hands of the councillors, the councillor has a small geographic space and a limited amount of people he or she is in charge of. You could have a system in your council, as a councillor, where you know every single family in your electoral district, you know. If you set up a proper system, you know, you will know who the families who are at risk in terms of domestic violence, child abuse, poverty, um, incest, what have you. The, these are some of the critical social service deliveries. When you look at Trinidad and Tobago and see the billions of dollars that is spent on social service delivery, and, and holding this so-called safety net for poor people. And, and poverty is still rampant in Trinidad and Tobago. Where is the seven and eight billion dollars going every year? You have to ask the question, okay? Because the system that, did, that is supposed to deliver and make these amenities reach out to the people, it is not reaching to the people who are most in need. Because the system to administer social service delivery is flawed. The classic example of that is the food card. I know. <laughs> All right. So we'll deal with that. Sporting programs, agriculture, local tourism, a, a very, very good example. Every regional corporation has potential local tourism sites. Good. Toku, Sandy Grandi Corporation, probably is way ahead in that in terms of ecotourism and, it, and, and, and the tourism product. But even down in the deep south here, we have the Labre Pitch Lake. Good. If the Labre Pitch Lake as a local tourism site could fall within the Separia Regional Corporation, it may perform better than under the TDC and the Ministry of Tourism. Because Labre Pitch Lake has been given international acclaim, but when you go there, it, it does not look like a tourist destination. Okay, so, so there, there's work to be done. Everybody talking tourism, 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 tourism. But you, you have to, 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 to drill deep into this thing, enhance the local tourism product at the level of your community, and then market it. Employment exchange. Again, we could build a data database of unemployment and network it with where the jobs are available. I remember Dr. Oli telling us some time ago, that he went to a CPA conference in Jersey, that's in the Channel Islands of, of England there. And he asked one of the members of parliament for, for in Jersey, what is the unemployment rate? Expecting the guy to say 6% or 7% unemployment. He said there are 162 unemployment people in Jersey. The database was so accurate. They knew the 164 people by name, by address, what their skill sets are, and they are anxiously waiting to match them as the available jobs come in. That is the level of detail this country has to reach to, to, to call ourselves developed. You know. Development is not about building skyscrapers and bridges. You know. Development is having an administration in place that these things could happen to better the lives of our citizens. And finally, the, the last couple points, local contractors. As far as possible within the legislation, we will try to let local jobs go to local contractors. Because it makes no sense that you're building a box drain down in Santa Flora and the contractor from Chagonas. Because if you have a local contractor, the chances are he will employ local residents. The chances that when they get paid, they, they spend their money in local bars and local groceries and local market. Okay? So the multiplier effect, the multiplier effect will, will be um, added to the economic activity in the country. So as, as I said, as far as the legislation will allow, we will have a system where by and large, local, especially small contracts, will have to be allocated to local contracts. I've said a lot about effective municipal policing. I wouldn't spend much time on that today, but what we plan to do is, is, is build the 
municipal police force to 100 for cooperation, which, which will give you 1,400 officers on the ground assisting the, 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 the national police. I welcome the Minister of National Security um, and Member of Parliament for point 14, Mr. Dillon. As a matter of fact, we had a meeting last week as to how we will, how we will work on the administrative structure of the municipal police. The, the, ju the jury is still out on it. Um, as we speak now, the municipal police reports to the CEO of the corporation. There isn't a command chain that takes you to the directly to the commission of police. And um, in, in terms of a quasi-military and national security function, um, there are a lot of merit in, in taking that command chain up to the commission of police. The developmental control, um, there's something called the Planning and Facilitation of Development Act 2014, which, which is a, a legislation that has been partially proclaimed. Um, we, as we speak, we are studying it to see whether we want to make amendments to it. But basically, that will call for um, regional bodies in charge of the planning process. So in other words, most of your housing plans and stuff wouldn't have to go to tongue and country for approval. Um, it will be the approval will be given at the level of the regional corporation, both the approval of the plan, the, the approval of the sub-development, and also the final um, completion certificate. Infrastructure works, we'll have a whole new model for, for dealing with infrastructure works. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, disaster management. And I just want to go on record, I've been seeing in all these consultations, Disaster management, first respondent coming out of the regional corporation is probably one of the best run sections of local government. Okay, and, and it goes to show, it goes to show how if you make a lot of responsibilities come down to the level of the regional corporation, how efficient it is. If the disaster management function wasn't delegated down to the level of um, regional corporation as first respondent, and it stayed upstairs with the defense force, you would have never had the response time that you are getting now. So, so it, it is a very, very fundamental thing, and we think this is one area in, in terms of the devolution of authority to local government that is working extremely well. But I just want to caution you that at its most fundamental level, disaster management is a function of national security. Because when the, the, the disaster is not in the hurricane or the disaster, how people just behave after the disaster. Okay? So then people start to loot, they start to thief, they start to what? So the, the disaster is really not the hurricane or the earthquake. It's how people perform and how they, they, they behave after disaster. I want to make a point on involvement of civil society. We may well include in the legislation a certain amount of consultation by law that has to take place before certain decisions are made at the level of the regional corporation. It's something new to Trinidad and Tobago because I think there's one piece of legislative requirement that says you have to consult, I think, in some aspect of law. But basically, the legislation in Trinidad and Tobago does not provide legally for consultation. We will probably want to include some aspect of consultation before major decisions have made with regards to development in your area. The example I like to show here, I said it already, but I'll repeat myself. If Walmart wants to go and build a store, a mega store in certain parts of the United States, they just can't jump in and do it so because they know Obama, you know. The city council meeting and tongue meeting in your tail. And if the community says, no Walmart coming here, you could know Obama, you could know Bush. No Walmart is coming into that community. That is the power of communities, okay? The state of Vermont, which I visited a couple of years ago. The state of Vermont is a small state as a matter of um, this presidential kind of easy. Um, Sa Saunders, yes, a Vermont guy. The state of Vermont has no McDonald's, you know. The state of Vermont has no Home Depot, you know. The state of Vermont has no Walmart, you know, because the people of Vermont says that they want to keep their mom and pop stores alive and their local eateries and stuff, and they want no chains in their state. And you'll be surprised to know that it's the only part of the United States of America where you don't see the big McDonald's sign and the KFC sign and the Home Depot sign. 
and one of the most beautiful parts of the United States of America. So that is the power in which your community has. The example I like to draw is Mr. London. If somebody wants to come and put on a big wash plant in Valencia, that falls under the ambit of the Minister of, of Energy as we speak. But shouldn't the regional corporation have a say? Because the wash plant now will pollute the rivers if the wash plant is not working well and they're sending sediments down into the water courses. The most pristine water courses in all of Trinidad is in Northeast Trinidad. The Valencia community should have a say in whether Mr. X or Mr. Y or contractor X or contractor Y wants to put on a big wash plant in Valencia. Regional development planning. We will encourage, and most of these um, corporations had done some work in the regional planning concept. You review your document and use that as your vision 20, what you want to call it. This is your plan for your corporation. This is where you want to see your corporation go over the next decade. This is the type of development that you want to come to, into your corporation. I, I could see a system like this evolving into competition amongst corporations. Asking businesses to come and invest in Siparia. As this thing from San Fernando, the highway passing here just now. Okay? You, you could develop a whole industrialization policy and say, um, in conjunction with central government, obviously, but say, listen, we want to have a small industrial estate in Siparia and we want to attract businesses in here and we want to make a, a business friendly um, environment for people to come and invest and do not leave investments solely under the control of central government. So that is where it will happen. Boundaries. All I will say on boundaries is there are 14 corporations as we speak. Whether 14 is too many, I don't know. You will know. The population of Trinidad will dictate that. 14 corporations with 14 corporations with executive power, is it, is, will that translate into too much government in Trinidad and Tobago? The jury is out. That's all I would say. Um, there are some justification to, to, to move boundaries slightly, especially along the East West Corridor. I don't really see the, the southern part of Trinidad and Tobago really suffering much from that. But in, in, in terms of um, Sawa Lavantil, Porter Spin, Tuna Puna, Piaku, I mean, some of those things we could look at it. But you can make comments on whether you feel the boundary should um, change or should not change. Um, whether the chairman of Stiparia, Mr. Mr. MP for Point Fourteen, was saying the Point Fourteen borough is so small. So I don't know if he wanted to get enlarged. <laughs> All right? So by and large, that is it. And finally, and I'll close on this point. The organization and the structure. Ladies and gentlemen, I say all these nice things, but the only way it will happen and happen effectively is if we have an organization, structure, and staffing at the level of the regional corporation that would execute the powers that we are going to give them. That to me is the biggest challenge. That is to me my biggest fear. Because as we speak, the regional corporations are so understaffed, it will call for a whole new cadre of employment. Most corporations don't even have an engineer. They don't have a quantity surveyor. They, they don't have supply chain managers. They don't have asset managers. And all of these are new 21st century skills. It's not this long time thing about WS1, WS2, WS3. It, it, it is a whole new organizational structure that we will craft, okay? for the regional corporation. And ladies and gentlemen, let me just make one point. We will be staffing it with young, bright people. <laughs> this country has invested too much money in gate for the last decade or so. Six billion dollars a year. Six billion dollars a year. We have so many young graduates, bachelors and masters, and most of them are underemployed. And let me just make another statement. In a very real sense, underemployment is worse than unemployment. Because how you will feel as a parent that your child went to university, to UWI, come out with a master's degree and have to take a job as a clerk in the public service. You wouldn't feel good. Because you feel that you have educated your child to hold a position of authority and influence directly in an organization. 
And what is frustrating the young people in Trinidad and Tobago, ladies and gentlemen, is underemployment. Because the, the economy has not been able to absorb the graduates at a rate in which they were supposed to be absorbed and in the right areas. So it's all nice and good to say that your tertiary level capacity has moved from 20% in, in 2002 to now 65 or 70%. But what happened to that extra 50% of graduates? Have you absorbed them into meaningful jobs? And these are some of the job creations that will come through the regional cooperation so that a graduate coming out of Santa Clara wouldn't have to look to Port of Spain to get a job. A graduate from San Francisco could come to the regional cooperation and, and find and a career in, in a governance structure that is related to your own community. So there's extremely first-class potential in this program. And finally, before I close, ladies and gentlemen, just penultimately, but let me just deal with one more point. Legislation, Mr. Stuart Young will deal with that when he sits here on, on the stage with me. But we'll be, deal we'll be um, dealing with, with the money bills, we'll be doing it with the revision of the Municipal Cooperation Act itself, and we'll look particularly at amending section 69 of the Act to reflect what is the governance structure that we will, we will be putting. We, we plan to put a, a cadre of what I call like omnibus legislation. So a package of legislation towards the, to the parliament, hopefully before the next local government. Let me correct the chairman of Separia here. We are not saying that the process will be completed before the next election. What we are saying that the legislative reform agenda should be in the parliament before the local government election, which is due October, November, somewhere around that this year. So that the, we, the country will know what legislative reform we are proposing to the nation. It will be very likely be subject to a joint select committee so that we'll have the direct involvement of the opposition and the independents in the Senate and the opposition in the House so that they can critique and, and, and interrogate the, 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 um, the legislational reform that, that we are going to give. And finally, I want to make the point, and I made it earlier, that this local government reform process is hard to believe this from a politician, but it is not political. The powers that will be handed over to the, to the mayor of San Fernando, to the chairman of the Tunapuna Piaco Corporation, to the chairman of Digo Martin Corporation. In Digo Martin Corporation, every single council, every single older man is PNM. But by the same token, the powers that the chairman of the Digo Martin Corporation has is the same powers that the chairman of the Penal DB Corporation has, because in Penal DB there isn't a PNM council and there isn't a PNM alderman. So that is the both sides of the spectrum, and there's all the, the differences in between, because you do not legislate for a particular group. You legislate for the entire country, and let the chips fall where they be. So we wouldn't want to hold back power because Siparia is a UNC corporation, which it will not be in the end of this year. But that is beside the point. Okay. But I, I, just, I, I just needed to make the point that this, this is apolitical. It, 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 it is national government governance structures that we are looking at. We are looking to provide efficiencies, and we really, um, our intention is really to bring a better lifestyle to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, as especially at the level of the cooperation. Obviously, we need your support and collaboration in this exercise. Um, we'll go through um, a consultation part, you know, for about an hour and a half, where we will take questions from the floor. Uh, Minister Young and myself will, will We'll sit here and, and feel your questions, and we will hopefully want to answer them, um, answer them in the best way we can. But I want to, 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 to bring to your attention, finally, that this is a consultation. We have come here to listen to you. If you do not like what I say, come to the mic and see it. If you like what I say, come to the mic and see it. If you want to critique what I have said, come to the mic and see it. If you want to add, subtract, or divide, come forward and see it. We want to hear. Everything you say is recorded. 
Everything, this is like the parliament. Everything, we have a hand side here. So everything you say goes on the hand side. Then we transcribe it into prose and into paper thing, and everything is studied. There's a technical committee that collates all this information, and it will come to us in due course, and we will know what are the main points that was raised in all the consultation. So ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much, and I just want to invite you to look at the final video before I take my seat. So once again, thanks a lot. That's Frank and Mo from Frank and Mo and Company. They checking out that construction going on up the hill across the river. A new residential something. Frank and Mo doing the environmental impact thing to make sure that a compound that big don't tie the whole place now. They get that contract from the council. Oi, Chris, here, have a blessed day. Oops, almost forget my breakfast. Thanks, Shireen. You too, Nibs. Texted in my order since I get up. Mm -hmm. And in May, local theatre company School Street Performance Group premieres its new musical at the School Street Community Centre in May. I in that. A couple years ago, there was no local news. And even if it had any, I absolutely wasn't taking out no iPad to get nothing nowhere around here. But things different now. As Maureen making her way to the new clinic. Local taxes build that. Carla just moved back from Canada. Toronto have nothing on School Street. Oh, by the way, that's the school they named School Street after. My brother worked on the new ventilation system for them. Kulo Brizo. His office is three streets down so. On time. Yes. The bus is CNG. We petitioned for a few more and we're working on insisting that only CNG buses can use our length of the bus route. The carbon monoxide destroying the limestone caves in the quarry and that will kill the tourism in the area. Now I see that the Komuto Council and the Pointer Pair Council asking for the same things. We's pioneers. <coughs> so. Ladies and gentlemen, we, I, we just use the opportunity in a graphic sense to juxtapose the first video to the second video. And between the first video and the second video is what we call the transformation process. I thank you all very much. Gentlemen. Thank you very much, all protocol observed. My name is Dudnat Meru. I've been a counselor for 10 years experience at the Sipara Regional Corporation. Good evening, ministers. Good evening. Good evening. I listen attentively to what Minister Khan said this evening, and the reform that he speaks about here, while we are all excited about what he said, I really want to find out if this, what is taking place here, will really happen before 2020. Because what you describe here in the whole transformation process seems like a very long journey. And what you said and the powers that you are giving to the chairman and the councillors, it is very clear that it seems as though the councillor and the chairman will expect a salary that on par with the ministers because there's a lot of work for the councillors and the chairman come after this reform. But there are a few points I want to raise here this evening. First of all, the abolishment of local government to rural development. Couldn't this change take place under the said Ministry of Local Government with the necessary legislative changes to be made and the amendment to the Act, that is one. Minister Khan talk about swinging the pendulum to develop areas without a political agenda. I really want to believe you. We look at what is happening on a daily basis and how government operates. While you were here talking about swinging the pendulum and doing things without a political agenda, Last week, your government approved five community centers at a cost of $40 million, all fell into PNM control areas. I want to know if this is what we're talking about. We're talking about the change that we want here and swinging the pendulum without a political agenda. That is number one. Number two, you are giving the councillors the authority to program their work in the various areas. 
Why can't a minister take up a phone and tell a counselor, hey, I would like you to program so-and-so project here and so-and-so project there. Then the next part comes into play. When a counselor has that kind of authority, what will he do? He will want to program the areas that he got his votes to win the election. That is what he will want to do. He will want to ensure that he retains his support but that by satisfying the needs of the people who first put him in power. There has to be a cultural shift in thinking by the people in this country. You talk about people standing up against Walmart and big enterprises in America. But here in Trinidad, when a government is in power and they bring certain things to you, the people who align themselves to that political party will stand up and say, yes, we will take it, whether it is good or bad for we. A clear example was recently the smelter plant in Labre, when there was a big cry that that was not good for the water table in the country and for the people. And some of the people in Labre still say we want it. There has to be a cultural shift in the thinking of people. I thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. And uh, Minister, some very um, interesting questions put to you. No, the, the, the issue, you see, there's a, a paradox in what the gentleman said. I have come here and said, this is the flaws in the system. This is what we, knew to f this is what we need to fix it. This is the new paradigm we have to set ourselves to put the governance structure in Trinidad and Tobago right, especially at the level of the local authority. Everybody here agree with what I said. And then you'll, you'll come up now and say, boy, it would not happen. We have to make it happen. We, we cannot continue to have self-doubt because it's self-doubt that will stultify our people, you know. And you cannot always come and say, is that political this and is that political that? Look at Trinidad and Tobago. Look, look, look at, look at, look at Shagwanas and Coover. It is PNM policy decisions that has caused the booming of central Trinidad and Tobago. So where is the politics in that? And, 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 and PNM policy on rural development will now come and impact on Sandy Grandi, Toko, Matura, Moruga, Siparia, Santa Flora, Labre, Erin. Ladies and gentlemen, let us start to understand what is happening. We need to get up, smell the coffee, and understand we need to develop Trinidad and Tobago. If, if I could just add, because the first question is, would it happen? The answer is a resounding yes. We have been mandated to make the legislative part happen, which leads me to the second point. So the legislation is going to be laid in Parliament before the next con the constitutional date of local government elections. The next point is, and this is something to consider, you talk about a cultural shift and a shift in thinking. No amount of legislation can drive that. As Minister Khan said, that's up to each and every one of us. Legislation will be put in place. It comes down to the enforcement of legislation and the mindset of developing how you implement that legislation. So that will happen. Okay, now the, the councillor also had a concern about the greater professionalizing of the work of local government representatives. How do you see that going, Minister? The, the what? The professionalizing, he was talking about the resources and he would assume so that the- the salaries. Yes. Well, obviously, remuneration packages will be based on, on the, the job specs of what you have. One of the reasons why MPs, not ministers, MPs and Councillors are so poorly paid. It's because the, it is the opinion of the Salaries Salary. Review Commission that they are part time. But de facto, most councillors and MPs work full time on their job. But as far as the, 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 the Salaries Review Commission is concerned, it's a part time job. So the legislative changes may well consider making right. councillors a full time job with a portfolio so that they could be adequately compensated for their work. Thank you very much. Dr. Ambachan, I see you, but this gentleman has been waiting for some time. Sir. Thank you very much for the accommodation. Yes. It's, it's on. I think you just need to go a little closer to the mic. Pleasant good afternoon. All protocols observed. My name is Vidya Devaki Singh. Minister, I heard you. I took some notes. We would like to see the consulate services 
come to our community. I'm referring to the second slide you have there, powers from the towers to ours. We would like to see the conciliate services coming down here, reaching out to our community. Immigration, licensing authority, the Erin port to be developed into a modern fishing processing plant. Reviving of the coconut industry. Reviving of the citrus industry. There are a structure on the corner of Allied Street and High Street. It has been used by TSTT as a facility they use. I want to suggest that we bring in the different utility services as the WASA, TNTEC, TSTT as a payment center. Rather than our people have to leave here and go to San Fernando. Yeah. I heard you spoke uh, as an example of the sporting facility. We need to have representatives from various ministries working in tandem with the corporation. And at the end of this, I want to say, on the first slide, they said, time to take action. God bless each and everyone. Thanks yeah. for your time. Thank you, sir, some responses. I, 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 I just want to respond to Mr. Devaki Singh there on one point. And, you know, this is the problem I had with, with the name changing from the county council system to the Municipal Corporation Act. Now, in the old days, it was St. Patrick County Council. Now it is called Siparia Regional Corporation. But it does not give the tongue of Siparia a monopoly on the corporation, you know. In the St. Patrick County, in the Siparia Regional Corporation, there's Siparia, there's Faizabad, there's Labri, there's Vecini, there's Santa Flora, there's Irene. So even in your own mind now, you, you cannot try to build Siparia as the capital and everything must come to Siparia, the tongue. It is just called the Siparia Regional Corporation because there's a lagging even in the context of the Siparia, outside of Siparia and Point. The other tongues are lagging way behind, you know. So we have to come up with development plans for Faizabad. We have to come up with a plan for what I call the Santa Flora stretch. Because from Quarry Village straight down to Erie, nothing is happening. Good? And, and then Faizabad and its environment. So I, 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 just, I mean, I, I live in Faizabad most of my adult life. I just call Faizabad the tongue that stood still. Good? Faisabad still have a bar named High Noon. High Noon was a Western in the 1960s. Good? But what you have now is come up with development plans for Faisabad. You have to come up with development plans, what I call the Santa Flora stretch. And you have to, to, to understand what role Siparia as a tongue will do in bringing the regional capital. Dr. Ambachan. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening to everyone, uh, ministers, members of parliament. I'm very happy to be given the opportunity to express a couple of views on the local government reform for two special reasons. One, I was born in Avocat and I live most of my life in Avocat. I still have property in Avocat. And secondly, I was the chairman of the St. Patrick County Council from 1983 to 87. Tells you how long I've been in the, in the political field also, almost 30 something years. So I have a very great interest in what is happening, and I want to commend you on your presentation. Very clear, um, very visionary. And to say that, you know, what the United National Congress or People's Partnership have as its vision for local government is not very different from what you have presented here. I think the difference will be in the capacity to get it implemented. And I'm glad that you referred to my stint as Minister of Local Government, because if you really go through the records of the consultations, we had 15, 14 consultations across the country, and the final document, you will see a lot of what you have said there in that document, especially legislative changes. Unfortunately, I spent only one year and two months in local government. But we also demonstrated during that period in local government that local government can perform if there is a shift in the consciousness of the people at the Ministry of Local Government itself. Not necessarily at the corporations alone, but at the Ministry of Local Government itself. 
And just to, to tell you, Minister, very quickly, it surprises people to know that in that 14 months, 60 local bridges were built, 31 pavilions were started in the country, which demonstrated that local government has a capacity to perform. And it's not about campaigning. I'm making the point that local government, if properly driven and managed and led, can in fact uh, achieve. Mr. You made, you made some very, very, very important points. I want to suggest that full-time counselor should be the order of the day. I don't think the part-time counselor thing works at all. Full-time counselors are required if the extent of the development and transformation that you propose is going to, to take place. I also think that the problem of local government is as much constitutional and legislative as it is about competent human resources, but this will include the quality of the CEOs who are now in the local government system. Resource allocation, I'm very happy to hear you talk about the taxes and the fact that um, local government will be allowed to retain taxes. But I don't think that the retention of taxes alone is going to facilitate the kind of development that you propose. And therefore, we'll have to ask the question, in the transform system, what do you envision as the formula that is going to be used in order to make the kind of financial resources available to local government? Are you going to use the, the formula for 4% like we have in 4.5% uh, whatever with the THA, or are you uh, going to propose some other formula? And I really do believe that what we have to do is to start with a zero budgeting and have proper strategic plans done in each one of the local government areas, engage the widest consultation so that you can develop at least a five to seven year plan um, which will, to which people will be committed and despite whatever political changes take place, that that is the plan that will um, go forward because it will be based upon the, re the receptivity and what people have agreed to um, as, as uh, committees. And that's why I think the last point, which you didn't go into, but which you put up there in terms of structure, I think that's a, a very important point. And I think that the structure as it exists now in local government is inadequate. Four statutory committees is not enough. And it's very fa uh, fast right now to see how many committees the councils themselves name, but they are not functional because they don't have the resources, they don't have the personnel, and uh, you know they are paid $700 a month or what have you to be a chairman of such a con uh, committee. But I think that's a farce. I think that's something that must be stopped. And I think that we should go to the system where you have a wider community base of people involved in the committees which feeds into the um, council. So the work of these committees are protected by the laws and that the committee work are taken seriously and um, brought to the council, like joint select committees or what have you, you know, some kind of adapted form. I, also, I, I think that that is very, very important if you to bring. So you named about 16 or 18 committees I saw at the end on, on your presentation. and I, I want to commend that and say that that, that should happen. I want also to say that... Uh, Local government should be protected in the Constitution. I really think it should be protected. And, uh, and while um, Mr. Young spoke about, you know, legislation is not going to do all, I agree with him. I agree with him. One of the, the things that we need is an instantaneously, instantaneous leap in this country and in local government. I think we have to move from keep saying we are developing, we are developing, we are developing. I think that's one of the pitfalls of our, our, and our demise. We must begin to say we are or we have become, and begin to act out what we should be, rather than keep saying we're striving to what we be. What we need to start acting out in our roles, what we want to be, rather than simply talk about, about the vision. But you refer to the Municipal Corporations Act, and I think that's very important. I think it's a good act. I really do think it's a good act. Not because I was a member of the NAR when it happened, but I think it's a good act. I think what has happened to the Municipal Corporations Act is that there is a lack of enforcement of the provisions of the Municipal Corporations Act. Okay. If it is that people do not want to listen to what I have to say, it shows the arrogance no, please, of, of, of the system. Please, please allow Dr. Like Amitra to make his point. 
because I think I do not think that this is a political yes. affair. I think it's yeah. an affair of, of coming here to speak about some important matters. Will, 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 will people please allow that? I, I can Ramachan take my to seat. I can leave if people yeah. prefer that. No, no, no. But I'm here on the behalf Dr. of my Ramachan, party, the United no, no, National no, no, Congress, no, no, and the leader of the opposition. I intend to make my points. Well, please proceed. Absolutely. We're Absolutely. listening. And no amount of shouting behind my back or insults is going to prevent me from doing it. I'm going to do it. Please, please proceed. proceed. The Municipal Corporations Act, I think it's a matter of not being enforced. And the, you have to strengthen the Municipal Corporations Act by <laughs> having the municipal police and so on and using them. But I want to go further. I want, I want to suggest that you have municipal court, municipal corporation courts in this country, which will dedicate itself to dealing with municipal matters. And you have very good examples of it. In Boulder, Colorado, you have a municipal court. In several parts of the United States, you have municipal courts. You have a municipal court um, also in um, Texas. But you need the municipal court in order to provide an accessible, e efficient, and impartial forum for people involved in cases involving municipal ordinance violations. You need to adjudicate cases consistent with the law, the needs of, individ of individual and the community values, because you are talking a lot about community values here today. And uh, you need municipal courts in order to promote public trust in the, in the justice system and in local government. And I think I want to suggest very strongly that you look in, in the laws as to how you incorporate a municipal court. So we take it that we'll get opposition support if a, a constitutional um, special majority is required then. That's the commitment you're giving. Let me say to you that as an opposition, <laughs> please, please, as an opposition, and I don't mean anything bad by saying this, when we came to the parliament and suggested that members of the defense force be given the opportunity to be empowered so they could have the powers of arrest and so on. You didn't give us support. But I want to guarantee you that anything that is good for this country, and what I say here today, we'll support in the Parliament of Trinidad. You, you spoke about cultural shift. You need a cultural shift. But you have to mandate a cultural shift in this country. And Minister Khan might start by mandating <clears throat> a cultural shift at the Ministry of Local Government. You need to deal with administration, you need to deal with procedures, and you need to deal with process. Do you know, Minister Khan, it, it used to take 19 steps between when a budget was passed and when money was first released for a project. Because of process flow charting that I introduced when I was there as minister, we reduced it to six. And do you know further what? Six weeks after the budget was passed in 2012, corporations were able to draw down money and begin the development projects in the country. Because we had begun to reform the system by which the whole thing was done. And we got, and we got opposition for, for change at the level of the, of, the, of the Ministry of Local Government. So you need, you need to do something with the attitude, the work attitude of the people at the Ministry of um, Local Government. The, no, Dr. Rambachan is going to be allowed to speak. Um, Dr. Rambachan, uh, perhaps you can, you can close off for the next point. I am not but he, he, has, he has a contribution to make and, and he's being allowed to, to make it. Dr. Rambachan, proceed, please. And please allow him to speak, everybody. I hope this is not, uh, you know, we are in charge attitude and you could deal with it that's going on here, you know. Let me, just, I mean, say Frank, you know. Frank, that's what's happening here. You know. yeah. If it is that the PNM people here want to say that the people who are in opposition have no place in the politics of the country, they are wrong. They are wrong. And if Dr. that is Ramachan, the attitude Dr. that Ramachan, is being supported, I hope that, that is not mood. the attitude yeah. of the, of, the, of the, the government towards people. the people. Okay, yeah, 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 he needs to, okay he Dr. Ramachan, you can now. close off on, on the next point. Yeah. On all of the other consultations, we limited people to a few minutes. We've allowed you to continue, but there are people who, want, who would also like to contribute. Okay, fi final point, Dr. Ambachan. My final point is a very, very important one. The facilitation of development bill that was passed. And that was supposed to empower local government with respect to simple plans and so on. We'd like to know what is happening with that and uh, whether, you know, that is going to be implemented and how quickly 
um, it's, going to, it's going to be implemented. I, okay, I, thank you, thank you I very thank much, you for, Dr. Amajan. for the opportunity, but thank I will you, submit you, a paper to you. Yeah, thank please you. do. Please, please. Yes. to you. Yeah. The details of our position yeah. please, on many please, of the please things that Please submit a, thank a you proposal in detail. And, 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 that, and that, is, that goes for everyone else as well. If, you, if there's a written submission, there is a mechanism for receiving written submissions that will be more comprehensive than the contributions you make from the floor. But I want to have some responses from both ministers on the platform. Deal, deal with the legislation and the, constitu the, con the constitutionality of local government. The truth is, Dr. Amachan, the point that you, one of the points you made, which is in agreement with one that I'd started, there is an enforcement issue. All right, the leg and I agree with you, the Mun Municipal Corporations Act is not a deficient piece of legislation, of existing legislation. So what we're doing is we're looking at deciding the policy shifts, and then we will work that in via amendments, for example, the collection and retention of property tax, land and building taxes by the corporation, and what you touched on, what is going to be, be the formula, because immediately it's recognized that different corporations have a different ability to attract different amounts into their pot, so to speak. So one of the things we're looking at, all corporations will be permitted and mandated to collect the property and the land and building taxes, but what then happens with it? Does it Retain, so for example, point leases, which will collect quite a lot under the commercial rates, would be at an advantage compared to point 14, for example. So we're looking at those types of things. There is going to be a collection and then the distribution, and you're right, it will probably come down to a formula. Obviously not a 4%, as happens with THA, and a corporation isn't going to have that amount. But we are going to look at a proper distribution, probably by the population of each corporation. And we're looking to minimize the amount of legislative amendments because, of course, we don't want it to become a burdensome, burdensome piece of legislation. And let me just add one thing on the allocation. We, we, we're seeking advice on, on how, we, how the resources will be allocated. For example, Minister Young said population. But in terms of infrastructure, take the Sandy Grande Regional Corporation, it has the largest geography, Correct. but probably the smallest population. But roads, roads and in bridges. terms of the amount of kilometers of minor roads, probably there's more in Sandy Grande. Arima, our council, is four square miles in size. Obviously, by no stretch of the imagination should Arima get the same quantum of allocation I say Sandy Grandi or Separia or something, but you know, you, you, you just have to say that now very discreetly because you don't want to offend the people of Arima. So, so what we'll have to do is come with a matrix that deals with geography, with population. It's going to have different with, parts with, with, of with the lack formula. of development, you understand? Port of Spain, for example, is a big city. Port of, Port of Spain draws the resources of a, a lot of a, a aspects of central government resources in terms of population, the Digo Martin Corporation probably has the most, the highest yeah, population. Okay, so there, you have to develop a, a, a full matrix, um, but obviously the, the, the discussion of central government in the allocation must play a part. Thank you, Minister. Sir. Good afternoon, my name is Winston Alexis, a businessman from the Faisabad area. Long before I heard the Prime Minister introduce local government reform, I've always daydreamed about local government. And this plan basically will be different from what the minister had highlighted. It's totally different, actually. My suggestion basically is just scrapping local government altogether. Because of the small country and political divide that we are, no matter how you want to say you're going to divide without politics, politics will always be an integral part of it. I'm saying once you have a, a government elected in the country, that government should rule the country in terms of local government and everything else. So you shouldn't have an election for local government with political parties involved. So basically, you have one election, whoever government in power, they control the, all the local governments. <laughs> for instance, in the Sapara regional area, I, my example is it's way too big from Faisabad, from Sapara and Fargo, straight down to Ikakas. Suggestion of that area is that there should be three basic divided into three areas. The Sapara to Erin, which is on the eastern side. Then you have from the Labri on the western side, so Labri, Faisabad, Opuch on western side, and the 
point four tomorrow will now handle the carcass and all those go to the point four tomorrow. As you mentioned, point four tomorrow will be small, but point four tomorrow could basically handle that whole carcass area there. So that will take care of that, that area. So these corporations will run by a chairman who will be elected by the government based on criteria. This body will basically be a reporting body, will be fully staffed and that sort. All the various um, government agencies and you have statutory bodies and com committees, they will now form that corporation. For instance, on, for instance, the Paris Regional Corporation, we now have WASA, TNTech, Minister of Health, Simcol, all those bodies will be on the corporation. What they will be doing basically is they'll be planning out the work, what needs to be done in that corporation. So WASA will say all WASA work, all TNTech handle, all TNTech, Simcoe handle, all waste disposal. So you already have all those agencies already and statutory bodies. They will take the responsibility for all, so you don't have um, duplication of effort because those statutory bodies will be taking those roles. But on the corporation, they will be there reporting in the corporation as sort on a monthly basis. So they will meet in their corporation, plan out what work, what works need to be done in the Safari Regional. They will bring it back to the corporation. In terms of councillors now, Councillors, on the other hand, will be elected in your village. For instance, you have Faisabad, Oopooch, you have different villages, Pepper Village, whatever. The councillor will be elected by the people. If you have a, a council election in which you have no politics in it, the councillors should be persons who live in the area, who, who work in the area with the people. So they have nothing to do with politics. So the councillor is elected. It's like you have a county council, you have village councillor, and your village councillor elected. This village councillor will be elected he will sit on the corporation and bring all the project from that particular village, he will bring to the corporation. Where you have WASA, TNTech, Ministry of Health, everybody there. So he will now bring whatever concern the village have to the corporation, who will then answer the questions, you know, of WASA, say, okay, we are running a road in, in Faisabad. WASA will have to report, we are doing this, so the, everybody in the council be aware of what WASA is doing, what TNTech is doing, and so forth. So in that way, all the, the councillors are really the people who meet in people. The council also should have, in every council, this council is a full-time person with a staff. He or she will be responsible for the community work, whatever happened in the community. So the community actually will then have a village council. The village council, which the council will be the person, chairperson of, will comprise of all the sporting body, the churches, the, the whatever in, in that area. This council, they will meet that council and share what concern they have. So that's how local government will be. They will share any concern from that level. Who will take it back to the council, and the council then will then meet and decide all the plans you have for the various areas. So it, 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 you get the politics out. You have to bring local government to the people itself. And the best way to do that is electing councillors who live and work in the area, who will take that responsibility, will bring it back to the general council. I said this council is a reporting body. Because you, have, you have already have... Ministry of Health. You have Simcol handling all, um, for instance, all scavenging work. These, these various no, no. bodies will have subcontract. Okay, so the I, contractors will then, I, you know... I, I, I think we get, it, we get the point. Now, right, Min thank you very much. Minister, what he's proposing there appears to be a completely different yeah, kind I mean, of, it, of model. It's, it's totally different. I mean, it's internally inconsistent because what he's saying is that children are too small for local government. But then you're articulating a system that having 10 times more councillors than we currently have. Um, so, <clears throat> but the idea of, of community groups and community council, I mean, that, that, that still exists under the local government system. So in, you, you will have a councillor for Faisabad, but it doesn't stop the having a Faisabad village council or Faisabad sporting organizations. But I mean, every point is, is something worth listening to, so it will be catalogued. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> It's pleasant good night. My name is Francis Bertrand. I'm the chairman of the Point for the Constituency. And I'm also a past president of the Association of Local Government and the World Conference of Mayors. Um, and during my tenure, I have been involved in local government for about 25 years. And um, clearly, I've been through several processes of transformation. And while I commend the, the minister for his commitment, I think there's always a bit of skepticism where local government is concerned in terms of genuine transformation. Because politically, some of the, the, the transformative measures suggested by the minister would in fact threaten um, the, the, the members of parliament and the ministers in terms of the devolution of, of power. 
And that is a political reality that clearly would have to be addressed. Because in terms of real transformation, under the new system, a minister should be at the level of a, a mayor should be at the level of a minister and be afforded that, that, kind, of, um, that kind of status. Um, in terms of the remunerative aspect, uh, while we talk about full-time and part-time, I think we should focus on just compensation for service. Because if you say the council is full-time, then you may detract from the quality of persons who may want to be councillors. A lawyer may not want to get into that because he can make more money as a lawyer. But at the same time, you would want to have councillors with competence to, to implement some of the new measures. Um, so it's possible to be a professional, doing your job, but also have a commitment to, to work and put out in local government. So that is a little dichotomy that has to be addressed. On the question of constitutionality of local government, that is very critical. But I guess, based on the, the political realities, it may have to be done in two stages. One, we may have to amend and implement a particular act, and then maybe after we try to get it into the Constitution. Because if we go one shot, as, as Stuart kind of allu alluded, uh, we're not sure how the, the, the opposition would react in the parliament, and that could stymie the process. That, that is, in fact, a reality, something we need to look at. Um, building capacity is very, very, much, very critical. One of the challenges with this new system is while we now have a, a smaller cabinet, we now going to have a bigger administrative structure in terms of local government. And there's a cost attached to that. You know, all the young professionals and so that has to be empowered. So from a financial standpoint, that, that should be considered. Um, fundamentally, I think any new dispensation should have a mechanism where the mayor of a corporation should be elected. Whatever the mechanism is, the mayor should be an elected official, um, albeit like the THA, or we can go directly. But I think it's, we, we talk in empowerment, the people must have an idea who is going to be the mayor when I vote in this particular election. Yeah. Um, so we have to get a mechanism where that, that is very critical in terms of empowering the people. And um, <laughs> another challenge, I, I think, the, the any government would have, and with these empowered municipalities, how would we then implement government policy in some of the opposition areas um, so that we ensure that the, the local government cannot stymie some of the national development initiative. In a perfect world, everything could work fine, but that is a, something that has to be addressed because you could find, God forbid, one government and then all the municipalities of the opposition and then you, you, you can see some, um, some challenges there. So we have to find a way to work that out. And very quickly, the question of local government, one of the fundamental conflicts has always been the question of the CEO and the council. Who is really in charge? The administration say, you come here for three years and you leave in, and the, the councillors say, we are the ones accountable to the people. Mm -hmm. So fundamentally, I think CEOs, councillors should have the authority to appoint a CEO. And you, you live or die by the CEO you put in power, you know? So that when you, when you as a council, if you, appoint your, if you appoint your friend and he or she can't deliver, the people will deal with that. But you shouldn't have a situation where the, the, the councillors are, are being pressured by the Burgess and the CEO may be of a different ilk, of a different kind of priority. So that I think that is an area that must be addressed because that is a very critical area in terms of if defect in of local government. Just, just finally, just yeah. two more points. The question of allocations. Yes, it is good to see we're going to collect the allocations, but the fundamental policy has to be whether it's going to be retained and whether it's going to be part of your overall allocation. Point four, they have been collecting allocations for years, but then when you collect 10 cents, they cut your allocation by that amount. You know? Mm -hmm. And then there's the challenge of the communities with industrial bases, like Point Fourteen, they have Atlantic Energy, and even Petrotrain, in terms of how you collect those royalties there. That is supposed to be done on a poor wellhead basis, you know. It has never been properly addressed. But you, you would find areas like, like Point Fourteen, Faisalabad, and these areas. That, that is something that um, could be quickly addressed. Just quickly, two more points. Um, well, yes, no, man. Two more points. <laughs> On the area, on the area of the 
of the, the boundary allocation. While the, the parliament, uh, while um, the election and boundaries have their, their formula, we have to come up with an effective formula. It's not only in terms of numbers of people, we have to be focused on the community because there's no reason why, why Cedrus, where point fourteen is the town set for those areas, Cedrus, area in some of these areas, they naturally gravitate to point fourteen. So Laza Trace, I mean, that's in point, but clearly their administrative center is superior. So some, from a practical standpoint, they are separated by the oil fields. You know, so when we, we have to look at that, both the, the, the demographics, and um, all in all, I would want to, to commend the, the, the minister um, for his efforts, the proof of the pudding would be in eating, and we would ensure, certainly in point 14, that we lend support and hold the, the government accountable for delivering this type of facility to the people. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Bertrand. Responses? Yeah, um, uh, I'm mean, just quickly respond. Um, Mr. Bertrand, you have to understand the, the, the difference between a borough and a regional corporation. Cities and boroughs are basically small geographic, largely urbanized centers. That is why you qualify as a city. There are two cities in Trinidad, San Fernando and Port Esquim. There are three boroughs, the borough of Chagonas, the borough of Arima, the borough of Point Fortin. So you cannot, based on that concept, expand the borough of Point Fortin to include Cedrus and Icacus. It is just impractical, that's not the concept of, of borough, otherwise you, you, you actually be making a point 14 regional corporation. Okay? And everybody wants to be city, but there are consequences of that because you, your geographic space is now limited. And um, so, so that, you, you, you're misunderstanding the concept of, of regional corporation, boroughs and cities. Secondly, the issue with CEO and council. The minister could say the same thing. Give me a chance to appoint my PS because the PS is thing. There's something called the Service Commissions, which is enshrined in the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago. And that was designed when we had our independence constitution, which separates the political interference with the operation of the administration and the public service. It is something we'll have to live with. And what you have to do as any corporation you have, you have to build relationships because the public service is protected by the Constitution. So, so that, that, that is basically the case as we see that. And finally, with your point on MPs, the point I like to make eh, is that the prime role of a member of parliament is that they are legislator. People vote you into office to be a legislator to go to the parliament and make laws for the country. What has happened because of port service delivery over the years, the MP has now become the main service delivery. So, that the member of parliament for point 14, when he goes to his constituency office, he have 100 people waiting to see him to find out to fix a drain. But that is really the role of the councillor. So the councillor would not be usurping the role of the MP. The, the councillor will be allowing the MP time to do what he has been elected to do. And, and that is the difference because how I judge the service delivery of Trinidad and Tobago is how many people I see come to the MP offices on a Tuesday. Because if you have a situation where people have to come to the MPs for simple service delivery issue, this system is not working. And unless the proof in the pudding is that when we get a local government infrastructure in place that is functional and efficient and effective, you will start to see the line at the MPs office dwindling. Thank you very much, Minister. Yes, sir, you have been waiting Good for a while. Good evening, all. Evening. Good, Philip is the name. I am here this evening in the capacity of a resident of the Superior District and also as an employee of the Superior Regional Corporation, the Public Health Department of the Superior Regional Corporation. Part of well, my function in that department is taking complaints from members of the public. I know right now, you know, in the, 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 the focus is on health issues with Zika and this and that and all that kind. But I think that there is something at present that is, you know, looming, growing, unseen, and maybe unnoticed, as I should quite rightly say, that no attention is being paid to. Now, before I go on that line, I just would like to ask, what would be the, 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 the position with respect to the functions of the public health sector in the corporations as, you know, 
would it be going hand in hand or duplicating what the Ministry of Health like CMOH, the functions in CMOH? That's one of the things I'd like to find out because at present, you know, we're seeing a lot of ineffective duplicating taking place, you know, with respect to, well, the mosquito infestation, rodent infestation, and that kind of thing. But I'm very passionate about something, Mr. Minister, in, you know, like within the course of any given week, we get 18, 20 complaints about rodent infestation. We have a very small team of rodent control evaluators, you know, and the thing that concerns me, they are not given the opportunity, you know, to be as effective as they should, you know, to, to alleviate the situation, well, the rodent infestation. So I would just like to make a little recommendation. I'm being very curt, K-U-R-T, not K-U-R-T, C-U-R-T in this case, yeah in making a simple recommendation to bring about, because I want to feel somewhere along the line, I mean, I'm not clairvoyant, but somewhere a little later down the road later this year, we could see an outbreak of leptospirosis or other rodent-borne diseases rain its head. We have a serious rodent problem in this municipality. The little 10 workers, like I was saying, we have, to put it in local parlance, that ain't working. Because when these goodly people leave the yard in Separia on any given morning, all right, they might be doing a complaint, let's say on Kura Road, the squad gone down there, they organize, you know, when they're supposed to go do their revisits, you know, they have to head down to Cedrus the next week, curtailing the effort to go back, you know, and do the thing. So I want to, to, to advocate, if we can have, or if the corporation could organize, you know, like the, the ministry, as a matter of fact, could organize to have where, like, you assign five persons per district. Well, the corporations, SRC is divided, as we know, into five different districts. You have five rule and control evaluators in each one of the five districts to save on time. You know, the time they're taking to travel from Separia to Lubri, you know, they might, well, yeah. And same thing, so, for the mosquito control unit, right? I mean, people who, there are people who of the, opi right. of the opinion that this is just, well, oh, another talk shop and that kind of thing. But I don't know. I think we need to be proactive, you know, instead of well, thinking about, yeah, we know we're in some recessionary times, per se, but we have to try, in this case, to avoid, well, that explosion. My main concern here is the rodent infestation, to avoid that explosion at that time. Okay, thank right? you very much, sir. Thank it you. is thank not you. the first concern that we've had in the consultations. With, with regard to the public, public health officers yeah, and so on, um, Minister? Pu public health, again, there's a duplicity of responsibilities. And, and that, that goes to show that how significant this local government reform process will affect the governance structure of Trinidad. And what he draw, draw attention to is a classic example of trying to devolve power and still keep it. It's the Ministry of Health. When the Regional Cooperation Act was implemented, that was under John Eckstein. That was to follow the, the system in England. And when the regional health authorities were formed, the Ministry of Health was supposed to just be a policy unit. But the Ministry of Health never gave up the powers. So you have three set of powers now in, in health. Local government authority in public health, the regional, the regional health authority with one in the hospital, and the Ministry of Health have the big stick over everybody. And that is what we're trying to get away from in the local government reform process. Because as we speak, Insect vector falls under the Ministry of Health. The Minister of Health asked me um, last week, he said, I would like to hand over insect vector to the regional corporation because it, it better resides there. So, so public health, I personally will be pushing that the issue of public health be largely a function of the regional corporations because it is only there that public health will, will be Effective. Effective because public health is to deal with the public and the issue of rodents, the issue of mosquitoes, the That's issue of, 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 of um, Aegis aegypti and, and that type of public health issue, sanitation. Sanitation and public health goes hand in hand. The regional health authority is, 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 is um, secondary and tertiary and primary health care, which largely resides with the hospitals and the health centers. So, again, there's a lot of overlapping and cross-wiring of the system, but this local government process will at least make an attempt to streamline, streamline responsibilities in an effective way. Yes, sir. The name is Ernest Thompson. 
resident Palaseko. Uh, Dr. Serge Rambachan just left, but I wanted to ask him kindly to stay out of the People's Forum when the people has the contributions to make. Now, I live in Palaseko, and I want to know what has been happening with Palaseko over the years. Tesoro has gone, BP has gone, and the place is a virtual shutdown. Now, I saw Dr. Serge Rambachan in Palaseko speaking about the repairing of the roads. In, 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 so, let me just answer up here. You're speaking to Minister Young and myself. Okay, okay. All right, so keep the focus on the local government. All reform. right. Now, all of this is local government that I'm tying into because the Superior Regional Corporation takes in from Oropuch to Ikakas. And it includes Palaseco, Santa Flora, Quarry, Erin, right? So I'm speaking with regards to that. Um, I want to know if there would be development in Palaseco with ter in terms of housing, interconnected roads, training for the young people, facilities down there, because there's absolutely nothing. The last time Dr. Rowley was here, I spoke about the NEC Center and it was open. In this consultation, my colleague talked about the rodents and the health. I had to go there too, but I withdraw because there is no interest, no emphasis on the rural development there. Now that you speak in rural development, I want to know one, would the corporation be in charge of issuing uh, contracts? Would they be the ones to facilitate any form of development in this part of the Southwest? Because it's apparent that under the last five years, nothing was done with regards to Palaseco, Santa Flora. Nothing. Big potholes in the road. Okay, so, right? so, so your, your concerns are the powers of the, the, the municipalities under the new system. You are concerned about the awarding of contracts and you're, you're concerned about and development within the, the corporations. Yes. Now, the minister did, attract, did, um, did address some of those issues. Uh, yes. Is there anything else you want to add to, to that? Well, I just want to know what these development structures be placed in the hands of the corporation or be placed in the Ministry of Works, the Ministry of Rural Development, and this sort of thing. I okay. want to know. Okay, thank you very much. The, I mean, there, there's still some semblance of overlap. The Ministry of Works will continue to be responsible for highways and major roads. The regional corporations under the statute will be responsible for minor roads, bridges, and and minor water courses. The Ministry of Rural Development is, is, is a policy oversight to make sure that the rural development agenda is achieved. But you see, ladies and gentlemen, I know the, I know the issues specific to this part of Trinidad. I lived in Faisabad for most of my life. I worked in Santa Flora for most of my life. And I have seen these two parts of Trinidad die between Faisabad oil field and Forest Reserve oil field, it's called the Faisabad Anticline, I'm a geologist. It has produced one billion barrels of oil, you know, from since it, it was formed, since it was formed in 1913, you know, one billion barrels of oil. Look at Faisabad today. The Santa Flora stretch from Quarry straight down to Irene, the Palaseco oil fields. That was the headquarters of Trinidad Tesoro and BP. It, 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 was, it is now the headquarters of the exploration and production arm of Petrotrin. But you see, when you do not understand a developmental agenda of sustainability, oil is a wasting asset. Oil is a de de depleting reserve. So everybody here in Faisabad, in Faisabad boom days, they had Strand Cinema, Empire Cinema, Hilo, down in Santa Flora, everybody was booming with Beach Camp and Palaseco and J.P. Small's Velodrome, not understanding that one day the oil will finish. And if you do not 
sow the seed of sustainable development. And you don't understand that and you get caught in the present. It will come back to haunt you. So now we have to, as a minister of rural development and as a member of the cabinet of administration, I understand what your issues are. And now we will try to craft solutions of sustainability. One of the issues we have in, in, in rural development is to sow an economic seed in each community. So for example, we will build the Moruga port, fishing port, we will build the, the, the Valencia to Toko Road and the, the ferry services to Tobago. And in these communities in St. Patrick now, we have to go and sow economic seeds to, to, to bring some form of sustainability to, to the, these areas. And we are now going to map them out geographically and look at the sociology of these areas and come up with meaningful development plan in relation to the regional cooperation. So for the first time, whether PNM or UNC in power, areas like these will come on the radar. Okay, because it, I, I keep making the point. I mean, I'm the chairman of the PNM, you know, so I could talk. This, this, is not, this is not a political thing. Take Faisabad, for example. Faisabad has had one MP for 30 years. You now have a second one. And under that MP, the UNC was in power. Okay? And nothing happened in Faisabad, in the constituency of Labrie. The PNM was in power for years, and still nothing happened in Lavery. Okay. So, so, so ladies and gentlemen, let's get real in this thing. I am on a developmental agenda for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you, Minister. If, if I could just add, because it seemed that part of, part of the concern you were raising is in, even in the boundaries of our cooperation, some areas would be neglected. Two of the ways we intend to address that from a legislative point of view is now that you would have your own budget, at least semi-annually, you have to come and present, as we do in Parliament, how the money has been spent. And that pre provides now the burgesses, the citizens and cities, with the opportunity to raise the concerns you've raised. So that's one way, at the budgeting level and the accountability as to how you spend the money will be to the people in the region. The second is we are thinking of introducing, as, as Minister Khan said, in addition to the planning stages, that you have town meetings, town hall meetings for the cooperation at certain points during the year to again allow people the opportunity to come forward and, and raise the issues as to what is happening or is not happening in their relevant areas. Thank you. My name is, <clears throat> the name is Dave Bim, pundit, teacher, lawyer. However, that's not my, I'm a citizen of Faisabad. And uh, I must compliment the minister, Minister Khan, on your presentation. It was wonderful. And um, I like the point that you said it was not political. My only problem is that you also said that many plans have come before. And you have the polit political will. I intend to hold you to that. Please and do. Mm. Because we have had many lofty plans before, as the former minister would have said. If this could happen, I beg to disagree with my partner there, who spoke about getting rid of councils and so forth. Because I do see that it will bring the people closer, and I think this is what local government is about. I heard some of my friends came up and talk about this is not getting there and that is not getting there. But I got the point where you said that you will be responsible. Because you will now decide whether you want a KFC and a KF, whatever. So I got the point that you, the people, will be uh, responsible. But my questions, and this will might be more to Mr. Stewart because it deals with legislation. The first thing, have you set in place, somebody needs to call, some set in place a timetable. I know that the minister can said it will not happen before the election. I understand that and I'm not on that. But if it is really going to happen and we're going to have the political will, then I want to follow that timeline that you are giving me. So when you set up your legislative framework and everything else, not only the legislation, if you are coming to consult with us, we must also have some point in which we can hold you to. To say that if you have said that by next year, so and so, so much legislation are going to parliament and we are going to be in that. So I'm looking forward to something like that. The legislation is going to parliament, as we said, before the next election. Okay. So by October of this year, the legislation will be laid in Parliament. All right. In uh, Dr. Um, I'm putting in a doctor. Uh, Minister Khan's 
pre uh, presentation. He spoke about, you know, like if I wanted to improve the health facilities in my area. And in also your presentation, you said, we are taking out the Minister of Local Government because now you are empowered, the money will only come from the Minister of Finance. If then I want to build a health facility, that will, I could probably build a physical structure. But I will have to have some sort of things to do with the Ministry of Health so as to get this thing enacted. What is the devolution of power then that will come from the Ministry of Health to the local government so as to happen, for that to happen? And my last question, before I take my seat, is that we have talk of constitution reform. Many things have been said. The previous government tried with the local government in the form of proportional representation. What is your stand in it, whether it's going to stay, whether it's not going to stay? Or have you all not considered that just yet? Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Some responses, Mr. Young. Well, as you know, the proportional representation is now part of the law of Trinidad and Tobago. We haven't had a, a discussion or a decision to remove the proportional representation. It was utilized in the last local government. So that yeah. would be a policy decision. That, that would be a policy decision. Um, on, the, on the face of it, I, I, I do not personally see anything so fundamentally wrong Nor do I. With, with, with the, um, proportional with the proportional as it, leads, as it relates to the appointment of all the men. Okay? Um, you, you made a point about the Ministry of Health. And what, you see, I want to, to make something very clear, ladies and gentlemen. We are seeking devolution of power to regional cooperation adding to the, the schedule of responsibilities that you would have. But I just want to caution you on one thing. We are not going to form 14 independent republics in Trinidad and Tobago. There's still something called a central government that is in charge of the planning process for the national right. development agenda. And there will still be a government of Trinidad and Tobago. And, and it is not a federal government with 14 independent republics and a federal system. You are local government in the context of central government with, 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 with enhanced powers and authority to run your communities up to a certain point. Thank you, Minister. Madam, you've been waiting. Good night, Minister, and everybody here, all protocol observed. So um, I'm here. My name is Debbie Cameron. I'm here in the capacity as a community activist and also the welfare officer in my community. So it's not political. So I've observed some things in this tongue of Saparia pertaining to the Saparia Regional Corporation that is very disturbing to me. So before you all leave here tonight, I know you all will tell me the real role and functions of the CEO of the Saparia Regional Corporation and any other corporation, right? I have some questions. Why should a CEO decide the fate of the re-election of a representative due to her actions. That is one. Two, refusing assistance to several community activities when the politicians support same. That is two. The Penal Debe Regional Corporation has been seen assisting community groups within my area. And we have a, a Sapphire Regional Corporation here with councillors and everything, already furnished. Three, all assistance to community group, like Sapphire Spurs, we have San City Boxing Group, we have Sapphire Envirofest Group, we have a group in Queen Am has been cut. In fact, I want to ask the minister if this time around when we haven't stuff in Saparia, if you all decided was not to send no money. I observe as a community activist on Carnival Friday, the corporation locked tight. No assistance to community group. And I mean that that is unforeseen because here I, here I sit and I hear you speaking about communities and enhancing communities and ecotourism and, and I'm not getting that out of the Saparia Regional Corporation. I almost finished it, don't rush me. Shall a vote of the CEO, the CEO be based on how much money she or he returned to the treasury or how much she did or he or she did for the community within the five years? And then I support the elected representative meeting the 
needs and not the CEO as it is going now. So I suggest, Minister, before you leave here, put the CEO right in this supply regional corporation for me, please. Thank you very much. And um, this gentleman will go next, and then the, the other person in line there is going to be our last contributor from the, from the floor. Uh, Dr. Bodo has something to say. Dr. Bodo will have the last word from the floor. So go ahead. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, the name is Francis Paul, former councillor, Maruga District. And I'm here representing Buenos Aires. Well, these days I'm staying in Buenos Aires. Um, Buenos Aires is a small community, almost in the middle of nowhere. And Minister Khan, um, in terms of rural development, you would understand why some rural communities have been neglected in terms of Buenos Aires is so close to point 14 and so close to Sipiaria, but their development is so far away from the community of Buenos Aires. Um, two things I want to raise. In terms of landfill, recycling, and garbage collection, in the expanded role of the local government reform, no, 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 would no, each municipality be responsible for their own landfill? And because there's a challenge in terms of garbage collection and the distance the municipal corporations have to go to, 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 to dump the, 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 um, the waste. Our case in point is that just on the Sipari Old Road there, the corporation has put up two signs, no dumping, and they're actually dumping garbage on the signs. So there's now a new dump on the Sipari Old Road, which is really causing a, a serious threat. That's one. And the next issue I want to raise in terms of um, agriculture, Ministry of Agriculture, rural development, and local government. Um, in terms of under the new, the new system, we're talking about devolution of power, and we're talking about empowering communities. Uh, what role would be played in terms of developing the local cottage industries, in terms of agriculture, like moving from primary production to processing, to assisting the communities, like what NEDCO is doing on a national basis? Would that happen within the local municipality? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I need to respond to, to, to those two points. First and foremost, the, I, I was very complimentary of the first respondents in, in terms of disaster preparedness. The, the worst performing aspect of local government technology over the years is in garbage disposal. We have been disposing of garbage the same way as we have disposed it since the 1950s. I said I met a, high, a pile high so on local government reform. The second highest pile was on modern methods to dispose of garbage. Nothing never happened. Okay? This is one area that I plan to, to, to have a proper discourse on and to come up with firm proposal before the whole local government transformation process is taken. We cannot continue to be filling landfill sites and just putting fill over them and do not separate garbage, do not recycle, do not have more than garbage disposal uh, mechanism. I mean, that is a classic example of two world countries. And, and um, so, so we, we, I'm, I'm working on that feverishly. Um, the second point about... Agriculture. Oh? He's talking about agriculture. Oh, agriculture, obviously. Agriculture has a, a, a critical role to play in rural development because by and large, rural communities are agricultural communities. And again, if you check what the Prime Minister has been saying, he is focusing a lot of, of this new administration efforts in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the area agriculture. of agricultural and agricultural production. Our food import bill is $6 billion. Yeah. Amen. Good. And, and when, when the, the, the government, the governor of the central bank inadvertently told us who were the biggest user of foreign exchange in the country, the biggest user of foreign exchange in this Retail. country is by smart okay and that is imported stuff so so we have to go back now to buy local like doc, like dr williams in the 60s you know buy local and eat local food yeah. and and, and that, that will be the trust in, in, in agriculture now and and the rural development minister is working very very closely with the minister of agriculture in in, in rolling out our plans okay so very quickly Yes, my name is Bernard Hines. I am the vice president of the Sipari in Coconut Allied Association. My concern is, firstly, uh, land tenure. Right? I've been in agriculture for the past 35 years. 
I got into agriculture due to Miss um, Muriel McDonough, Mark Davidson, died in the years gone by. And for, for all these years, we've been clamoring for regularization, right? I represent a lot of farmers in this area, from Irene, Santa Flora, Palsico, and thing. And everybody at this point in time, still waiting on that piece of document. Governments came and governments go. And nobody seems to be paying attention to agriculture. No government at all, right? Because it seems like nobody wants to eat. Like, I, no, right now I'm hungry, I go, I go, I need some provision, right? It's important, right? And, 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 and yeah, you'll get that, don't worry. Uh, another thing too is the allocation of plants, right? Now we're looking to, to revamp um, the citrus in, industry in this country, right? Now, I'm a certified um, plant propagation person, right? Good. And our problem is obtaining plants from the, the nurseries, right? And I believe that the people who are edified in these areas that we need to be, um, they need to pay more attention, right, to these, these people, these farmers. Good. Another thing is water. Water. I, I am a pig farmer. I recently introduced two cattle to my farm. Turkeys, ducks, fowls. Problem with water. They promised to dig um, ponds first. The extension officer called me recently, asked me if I'm interested in ponds. I said, well, we clamoring for that for the longest while. Nothing is being done. And the Wasa water is in, um, in a, in a, adequate to, to, for this, our projects, right? Well, we can't do short-term planting at all, right? We business is about cassava and planting and so forth. And as you say, Mr. Minister, that our import bill is too high for food. And if you pay some more attention to the small people down here who cry out to you, when time, election time, we, we see you guys and our cry is always there. Please attend to our cry. Thank you very much. Well, the minister has already addressed the issue of food yeah. production yeah. and the role of, of local government. Yeah, I mean, uh, I would just comment to see that he, have, he has hit the nail on the head. The three big bugbears in agriculture is land tenure, water management, and the third one he didn't mention is marketing. Okay, and once you, we, I, I mean, I speak to the Minister of Agriculture, I'm not an expert in agriculture, but those are the three issues. Right. Once we, we, we get solutions for those three issues, I think we are we well on our way to increasing agricultural production. Okay, thank you. Um, so very quickly. Yeah, good evening to everyone. My name is Peter Sozano, businessman in the area, and also the president of the Evolution Go-Karting Club. Now, a lot has been mentioned, and it sounds really good, and I support a lot of your ideas, but all work and no play make Jack a dull boy. <laughs> and our club has been set up in the area to bring the young people out and do things that's positive. We have had a lot of support from Mr. Dudnat here to make it possible, and we are trying. You mentioned the Santa Flora to Palo Seco stretch. We have a plan for that stretch. We have a plan for this area that will change the way people look at South. It's also a plan that's supposed to roll out into schools because we want to create safer young drivers. I lived in London for 20 years. And before I went to London, when people get an accident, they go to the hospital. While I'm there, I'm hearing, as they crash, they die. If we could create this carton club, could create something in schools that could create safer young drivers, a lot of parents wouldn't be crying today. So if we could get support from you all to have a facility for our club, we could roll that into different areas and help the community development as well. It's a community development club. That's my contribution. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yeah. Well, well said, and, and I, I think you will have the support to speak to the chairman of the corporation. Thank okay, you very Councilor. much. Thank you very, very much, quickly, Mr. Councilor. Moderator. Good evening, ministers. I'll just be one minute. Um, Minister, I want to commend you on an excellent presentation. What I want to say from what you presented you spoke about the level of detail needed to take us to being a developed country. And at the same time, you spoke 
about the fact that the plan is not complete. You are waiting on the consultations to be completed. Look at the body of, of suggestions and so on that have come from the public before you go forward with the plans. Um, I would just like to ask a couple pointed questions to see where you all are thinking of heading, if not decisions being made already regarding a couple of issues. Number one, the system sounds fantastic. It's very, very um, dynamic. I would like to know in these lean times, do you all have a ceiling on the budget to make this transformation a reality? That's number one. And if you do have a ceiling, what is that ceiling? Because we all know we live in lean times in terms of revenue from oil and gas. That's number one. Number two, you speak about the corporations being in charge of their development in their particular regional region or borough or city. Then could you elucidate a little more on what is the actual role of the Ministry of Rural Development then? Because I'm not tying it in. I'm not seeing the link. If you could just elucidate on that for me. Um, also, you put up a chart that showed thir possible 13 committees. Is the legislation, Minister Young, going to provide for specific amount, numbers of committees? Because, for example, in Separate Regional Corporation, we have 13 members of council. And if you have 13 committees, are you going to legislate for that? Or are you going to leave that up to the regional corporations? Um, and last but not least, whereas ministries of health, works and transport, culture and education would now have some of their responsibilities come under the purview of the regional corporations. Do you all foresee any one redundancy in terms of jobs? And two, I know I'm just predicting the, the answer. If there's no redundancy, then is there going to be a systematic absorption of workers into the regional corporation? Right? Thank you very much. Thank you. I look forward to your answers. Perhaps you can take Dr. Bodo. You want us to take Dr. Bodo? No, 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 let me, let me just oh, respond yeah. to um, the... Obviously, there will be no redundancies, okay? Um, as the, as the, the process unfolds, people will be re reallocated. But what I can tell you, there will be the creation of a significant number of new jobs. That, that, that is a fact. In terms of a cap for the, the, the transformation process, the transformation process itself, the process is cheap, you know? The process is just hosting a consultation like that, paying some lawyers in... In the, in the Ministry of Legal Affairs and setting up committees to work out the plan. The money really is in the implementation of the new governance structure in the regional corporation. And I, and I, I went to town to identify where monies could come from. When I made the example of the recreation grounds, 4 million for 130 something grounds, we are the Ministry of Sports through the sports company spending hundreds of millions of dollars on Gong. It's just a, a, a poor allocation process in terms of where you get best value for money. And, and, and that basically is, is what would happen. The country, eh? let, me tell, let me just get one other thing straight. The last budget that Mr. Manning had in, 19, in 2010 was $45 billion. In 2010, you know. The last UNC budget was $63 billion. Check 45, 55 is $13 billion extra. Okay? The issue, ladies and gentlemen, is that for 1.3 million people, 50 and $55 billion is a lot of money to run a country, you know. It is just the allocation of resources, the hemorrhaging, the corruption, the mismanagement, and the inefficiencies in the system. Well and once we get that right, it, 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 this country, you, when you look at the quantum of expenditure that, that, that passed through, you want to look and see what you got for it. Because the inefficiencies in the system absorbs the money like, like a sponge. And you do not get delivery for the type of resources that, that, that we go. And let me just make one more point. And the point I forgot to make in my presentation is productivity. I said it to the level, uh, all the other consultations. Let me just close by saying this. 
the lowest productivity probably in any arm of government is local government. You cannot go to a regional corporation office 10 o'clock and meet anybody. When you look on the roads to see where the gangs are, 8 o'clock, they had nobody working on the road. So all this talk about local government before and empowering local government, you all have to get all the act together, you know, because the government is not going to spend money to waste it. In. Okay, and, 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 and I don't want to say put that in your pipe and smoke it, but I almost mean that. Just to follow up on your last point about the 13 committees, is something we're going to have to look at, recognizing, of course, the resources. I mean, we face the same issues in Parliament with the number of joint select committees and statutory parliamentary committees, etc. So I'm not going to commit now saying it is, one, going to be 13 definite committees, and two, if we legislate, we're going to have to to bear in mind how you're going to man these things, the resources, etc. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. I want to say a special welcome and thank you at the same time to Minister Scan and Young for um, and welcome to Separia. Separia is actually part of the constituency of Faisabad, and also to my parliamentary colleagues from Point 14, Labre, and uh, Senator from the um, Alison Bash. Um, like Minister Khan, I myself. Uh, I have deep roots in Faisabad. I was born in Avocat, St. John's Trace, and um, now the newly elected member of parliament for Faisabad. Like you, Minister, I share the view, especially with regards to the lack of development or the stationary development in Faisabad Main Road. And I was very pleased to hear you mention, and I quote you now, um, economic analysis not being the basis of rural development. And I agree with you, because in the last six months, I've actually attempted to get a second bank into Faisabad. Um, we had some, someone come and visit, and of course, when they do the maths, it doesn't make sense. I've also attempted to speak with uh, some of the, the, the food um, companies to come and look, but of course, again, when they do the maths, it's not feasible. So I hear you talk about uh, direct government intervention and planting the economic seed in Faisabad, and I do look forward to that. And of course, the Faisabad main road does the development, as you mentioned, High Noon is still there. Um, and of course, you would remember the days when Hilo was a uh, thriving um, grocery and so on. Um, just to also support you uh, in terms of the, um, just to mention as well, ecotourism, and the, to mention that the, um, the Rupuch Lagoon would lend itself to, to that kind of project, as well as the revival of agriculture. In, in some areas, it's a mixed constituency in terms of both rural and uh, urban areas. Um, I also want to commend the, the citizen engagement aspect of your, of your um, presentation. I want to commend you as well on your excellent presentation. Um, I think it does have an important role in local government. And just to also say that the public health issue is one I would be very happy to see dealt with. As the former chairman of the Southwest Regional Health Authority, I had the situation where in terms of pub both public health inspectors, some were employed by the Ministry of Health and some by the RHA, and particularly as well with regards to the, the County Medical Officer of Health, um, who would be employed by the Ministry of Health, but would have um, RHA employees under, under him. So it did create that dichotomy, and I really think that needs to be dealt with once and for all, and I, and I think local government is a perfect op opportunity for that to happen. Um, I also want to um, agree with you that they, I don't see it as a threat to the Member of Parliament. In fact, it's, it's supposed to be a symbiotic relationship um, in terms of you know, helping the Member of Parliament in terms of the infrastructure. I do agree with you that um, lawmaking, of course, is our primary concern, but I will close by saying that, of course, the second most important function of a Member of Parliament is oversight of government function, and of course you will appreciate that. So we look forward, um, Minister, to the, your um, development, and again, I thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Some closing remarks, I'll invite uh, Mr. Stuart uh, Young to say. Well, I'd just like to thank you all, all for taking the time out to come and make what is a building and a, a ruling amount of success with these public consultations. Thank you very much for taking time out of your evenings and your day to come and contribute here today. I think it was a, yet another successful session and I think we've been going from strength to strength. 
this is something that we've been mandated to do by the Prime Minister, that is get the local government reform completed. It will be completed this year, as I say, by October, November. We will have the legislation in place in Parliament, and we take it from there. But it will come down at the end of the day to each and every one of you living out and, and filling out what you see local government and the transformation as taking place. So I would just like to end by saying thank you very much for the hospitality, <coughs> and it was a good session once again. Okay, um, my closing comments is that this is the fourth consultation we, we have had. Um, as Minister Young said, this is going from strength to strength. Um, we have this, um, had this course on the fundamental issues. Um, each consultation, people bring up issues that are unique to their own cooperation, right. so you are entitled to so do. And while part of the discourse is on the general principles of the reform and the, the uh, reform agenda, obviously we will still expect specific comments as it relates to your regional cooperation. I just want to close by saying, as Mr. Minister Young say, this project, uh, this issue, has the direct buy-in of the Prime Minister. If you heard him on the political platform before the election, virtually every night, especially if he's in a rural community, he spoke about rural development, local government reform. At our first consultation, he, he graced us with his presence to open the conversation, and he, he partaked in this panel discussion. There were three chairs down at San Fernando. It is hoped that he will attend a couple others before we close off at the final consultation in the Diego Martin Regional Corporation, in which, in which he will be a stakeholder. But ladies and gentlemen, let me just make one point. I get this throughout all the consultation, a certain semblance of self-doubt. They like what can say, boy, but me feel that will happen, you know. Good? We make a good presentation, boy. But somehow, we, we, as a society, we continue to doubt ourselves that good things could happen. We come like the West Indies team, they're so accustomed when they take the young boys to come and win the world tournament, you know, to bring back a sort of self-belief in, in the country. So I want to give you the assurance that believe in us, believe in yourselves, believe in yourselves that you can have this transformation take place. It will be the betterment of your own communities. Support this administration, support the process. As I said, it is apolitical, it is non-political. It is for the benefit of all the regional corporations and all the local communities. So with that said, I thank you all very much for coming out here to this lovely facility in Siparia. Have a good night and a safe trip back home.